Um, I'm going to just going to start standing back with the, with the broad vision and and the rough rough agenda and outline, and then we'll just go into the details with the people following. Um, <clears throat> so the the concept here uh, with the Real Food Campaign has been that we need to have a, a structure in place, an incentive, a process um, by which people can be supported in doing what's not only good for them, but good for the, the greater good. Um, my personal background uh, in my 20s, being an activist, doing political stuff and you know various other things was that truth was nice, but money was power. Anybody familiar with that concept? Um, um, so, uh, you know, as I, as I personally got, you know, more committed to farming and as a lifestyle, as a way to feed my family, and it became evident that what I had been brought up with as far as being an organic farmer was not sufficient to accomplish those things, um, you know, I, I personally dealt more deeply into what we call principles of biological systems, how do these how do plants work in nature um, from a farm viability standpoint? How do you get, you know, pest resistance and disease resistance and and increased shelf life and all that kind of stuff? Um, so, my background was as a farmer looking to make a living farming as a as a lifestyle. We found out that actually the best way to make a living farming is to have healthy plants, um, and uh, that happens to correlate with healthy soil. Uh, carbon sequestration, ecosystem service benefits, um, increased shelf life, better pest and disease resistance, better nutrient levels, better health outcomes for uh, the people, the animals that eat that food, whether they're cows or chickens or, or people. Um, and so uh, we've had this insight now for probably 10 years that if there was some way to economically align these multiple interests, this is not a you know, a, a, um, a triple bottom line kind of a thing. This is an octuple bottom line. This is a, you know, I don't know what the <laughs> 12 times bottom line. There's all kinds of, of wonderful uh, positive feedback loops that can come from engaging the land more harmoniously, more systemically. Um, but we have to deal with the fact that our culture is, is um, seems to be governed by, by lucre, by money. And so, uh, the concept here was that if we could give consumers the ability to choose what food they purchase based on its inherent nutritional value, um, and they use the money they spend on food, the, the idea is that most people spend money on food. Most people eat, most people buy food, most people don't grow food, so we can use the money that's, that's spent on food to incentivize the supply chain to move in this sort of more holistic direction. So. There's the fantasy, um, the vision. The concept was we wanted to be able to do not something like a refractometer where you have to actually take the crop and squish it to get enough juice out of it uh, because you can't really go to the grocery store, take an apple, take a chunk out of it, test it, say, no, I don't want that. Um, <laughs> right? That's not really accepted. Um, so we needed a non-invasive non -invasive strategy to assess quality. And so spectroscopy was the field, the mode, which um, seemed designed to, you know, operate in this in this manner. Uh, functionally, I like to say that um, <clears throat> every compound in chemistry is the vibration in physics. Um, um, you know, copper, zinc, protein, carbohydrate, you know, secondary metabolites. Whatever the thing is that you're looking at in chemistry, it vibrates at a certain frequency in physics. And so, in the same way, you can flash a camera at a person and take a picture of the light that bounces back. Um, you can, at a different frequency range, you can flash a light at a carrot and take a picture of the light that bounces back and effectively assess what's in that carrot. Um, so, you know, all these different elements, all these different compounds vibrate at a certain frequency. And so our objective here is to be able to give consumers the ability to assess in real time what's in that food um, beyond the label, beyond the marketing, etc. So. I'm guessing most people here are conversant with this vision, so I don't need to spend too much time belaboring it. Um, but we have uh, identified you know, a couple of key steps that are necessary for the broader agenda to be accomplished. Um, the first step is we need to be able to build a handheld tool at a consumer price point that can plausibly be used to accomplish this objective. Um, so that we 
you know, handed out, or we showed people the first generation of that last year at our conference, and then uh, tomorrow night we'll be handing out the first public versions of those to people who are taking them home to go and do, uh, or help, help with the development work. Um, so that the actually building the handheld tool is not the heavy lifting project here. Um, the heavy lifting of this whole project is a couple pieces. One is, what is quality? Um, for people who are, you know, have gone down this path at all, and ask some hard questions, the, you know, the, the real issue, one of the major issues is we don't have an empirical definition for what quality is. Um, many people claim quality. I'm an organic farmer. I've got high quality produce. I'm a local farmer. I've got high quality produce. I'm a permaculturalist. I've got high quality produce. You know, just beyond the fact that you think you're a good person and you think you're doing a good job, um, I grew up on an organic farm where we knew we had high quality produce. Our noses were well elevated. Um, and, and so just because we thought we were doing a good job didn't mean that nature agreed with us. In fact, nature didn't agree with us because she was taking out our crops. And so um, having some way to, you know, in a multi-factor manner, not like I'm certified organic, therefore I'm good, but from uh, levels and ratios of elements and compounds, from the correlation to shelf life and flavor and aroma and pest and disease resistance, et cetera, can we define what quality is? And the only way to do that really is with a big data set. Um, we're the, one of the big issues or opportunities that we're engaging with this, with this real food campaign process is a shift from this sort of, I would say, reductionist paradigm. Um, we're just looking at carotenoids. We're just looking at your fertility program. We're just looking at nitrate levels to a multi-factor system because we understand that nature operates with these numerous feedback loops and secondary and tertiary pathways. It's a much more sophisticated and nuanced system. Um, so how do we actually define empirically in a way we can comfortably present in a peer-reviewed journal? We can go into the public and, to, and actually have a serious scientific conversation because that's you know, part of the language of the day. How can we engage this question about what quality is seriously? And so um, the process we've put together is one whereby we are, you know, are documenting all these different metrics simultaneously. So what, is the, what are the you know, mineral analyses? What are the carbohydrates? What are the proteins? What are the secondary metabolites? Um, you know, what, what are all the different compounds present in this carrot and this carrot and this carrot and this carrot and this carrot? And once you have a large enough data set, then you can start doing things like um, statistics and AI and all kinds of you know, more higher um, math to, to look for patterns. So the proposal is we're looking for a pattern. We're looking for correlations between certain mineral levels and ratios and certain compound levels and ratios. And our, 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 our hope is that we'll be able to define a continuum and say this is at 5% on the continuum, this is at 40% on the continuum, this is at 80% on the continuum. And that's what we'll be able to actually spit out with the tool that you use at the grocery store or the farmer's market. But uh, we don't have the answer to the question, what is quality? We have a process for, for answering that question, uh, which we're well, you'll hear about where we're at and how it's been proceeding. Um, the third uh, step in this process, one is building the tool, one is figuring out what quality is. The third step is what causes quality? Uh, what are the environmental, environmental conditions that correlate with um, healthy crops, with unhealthy crops? Um, there's um, you know, management practices, uh, you know, tillage or not tillage, fertilizer or not fertilizer, amendments, foliar sprays, inoculants, uh, which varieties are you using, you know, Bolero versus, um, I don't know, red cord chantonet, um, the epigenetics of those varieties, what was the health of the mother plant and the grandmother plant that, you know, produced this seed, because that has a major effect on the health of the baby. Um, the climatic conditions, um, not that we can necessarily properly identify it, but I'm personally of the opinion that the intention of the farmer has a hell of a lot to do with things. Um, so how do you quantify <laughs> intention? Um, what are all of the causal dynamics that are involved in the production of a crop? Um, what is the process by which we can honestly, empirically, and transparently begin to capture those data sets? Um, and then our hope is really to be able to go, so I mean, the idea, right, is consumer, whatever, Jane housewife, Jack house husband, whoever, whatever your person is, yourself, you're at the grocery store, you're at the farmer's market, 
You flash a light at the bunny love carrots, there are 14 out of 100. You flash a light at, you know, I don't know, Bolt House Farms, and there are 40 out of 100. And not saying this is actually what the truth is, but, you know, Cal Organic is at 65 out of 100, right? So um, we don't want the farmers to hear about this when the buyer says to them, your stuff is no good, we're not buying it from you. We want the farmer to be able to go into the field in real time, maybe even take this little gizmo, flash a light at the leaf, and we'll be able to say, based on your soil type, fertility program, and management practices, it looks like two grams of cobalt per acre plus um, one gram of, I don't know, acidophilus is what you need to activate this B12 pathway, which will functionally create a crop of much higher traditional caliber. Right? We want to be able to work proactively, openly, collaboratively with everybody in the supply chain to empower them to produce crops of, of a higher caliber, nutritionally, energetically, coherently, et cetera. Our thought is that through enlightened self-interest, through a transparent collaboration, those of us who want to coalesce around this broader objective have a structure and a process to do so. So that's really the, the broad strokes of the Real Food Campaign. And there's a whole other level of it, which is how do you talk to people about it? Um, we had this issue last year at this conference when we were going to be handing out, or at least showing people, the first generation of the tool, and we, you know, got some introductions to people at Gizmodo and, you know, Tech Crunch, and, you know, the the journalists are calling us, and the, and we're talking about this tool that can test the variations in nutrient levels in crops, and they're like, the nutrient levels are on the package. <laughs> what are you talking about, nutrient variations? Right, so on one level, those of us who are down the rabbit hole in this whole biological system understand there's these massive variations. They correlate to all kinds of, you know, ridiculously exciting things. But in the mass consciousness, food is like plastic or like metal. It is an industrial product. It is presumed to be relatively uniform. Right, we have, we have not, there's, this, there's a shift in consciousness that needs to be undergone where we understand the correlation between the health of your child actually correlates to the health of the milk. It doesn't matter whether it was certified organic or not, it matters whether the, the cows were healthy. It actually correlates with the health of the environment. Um, so telling that story is a whole other piece of this conversation, which we'll get to probably at the end of the presentation here this morning. Um, but the majority of the presentation is going to be about the logistics of um, this process, where we've been, what we've done, um, who we're working with, what data we've collected so far, where we're going, um, and hopefully how you all, those of you who want to, can be engaged going forward. So how much of my time have I used up? Thank you. <clears throat> Resounding applause. Um, I think we might have time for a couple of questions. We, we, we've tried to time it out with the presenters so that we have a certain amount of time and then time for a couple of questions. So I don't have, here, watch this. Let me just see how much we've got. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah, so where we're at with the process of the shiny object, just to f um, frame this whole thing, um, where is it, crows or whoever, right? Um, there's a shiny object hanging in the tree, a piece of metal, and they just they can't get your attention off of it. So I refer to the meter as a shiny object because people, you know, it's like it's easy to attach an idea like, oh my God, this would be amazing. Um, as I said before, the process is much broader and more significant. So um, where we're at with the shiny object with the bionutrient meter is that um, th we have the circuit boards for 400 of them um, at the lab in Michigan. Um, all of the cases have been 3D printed. Um, with everything else that was going on, we don't have as many here calibrated as we'd like to. But um, we put them out for sale, I think, three weeks ago. And the first 75 or 80 have been ordered. So. Um, if you don't get yours here today uh, or this weekend and you order soon, you will get it by Christmas in the mail, quite likely. So that's the, that's the time frame. Um, they are not calibrated, consumer-ready tools. This is a, we're calling it a developer kit. Um, the process that we're engaging in here is one where we need to build the data sets first before we can run the statistical analysis on them and find the patterns and come up with a calibration that means something to a consumer. 
So right now, if you have one of the tools, it's going to spit out at you a series of peaks and valleys on a graph, which means nothing to anyone until we have a large enough data set to build a calibration with, if that makes sense. So if you haven't ordered one yet, you certainly are more than welcome to. Um, they're not calibrated for consumer use. This is a developer kit that's used for people who want to help us in this process. And you're going to be talking for the rest of the morning here about what that process is so everybody's clear about it. Yeah? Let's say you, you're a farmer and you sign up and you're... Yeah. Uh, say you specifically. Together, <laughs> what, would you, can you, what would you imagine you would do working with the BFA over the next 12 months? What would you all like to see ideally? So what, was, what has been really exciting is that since we put this tool out for people to pre-order, we've had orders coming in from, I don't think we've got any from Africa yet, but every other continent besides Australia, we've got partners, universities, well-connected, you know, UN, FAO, you know, not, not that a small farmer is nobody, but um, there's a bunch of really exciting partners who are in, wanting to engage in this collaborative data collection process. So. Um, Part of what we did as part of, as part of the um, proof of concept phase this calendar year was develop a data partners program where uh, farmers, growers can um, input your information about your soil type, your fertility program, your management practices, your sort of background data, um, and then um, you know, literally flash lights at the plants while they're growing at the crops once you've harvested them. Um, you know, take the crops and the soil, send them into the lab so we can build the, build the formal calibrations against, against benchtop um, equipment. So, you know, it, it really depends on who the person is and what their skills are and what their passions are. Um, uh, a big part of what we need, need to be doing this year, which what we haven't done, what we need to be doing next year, which we haven't done this year, is input the already very large data sets that show variation in crop quality um, correlating to, you know, management practices, et cetera. There's already a bunch of information out there um, sitting, waiting to be integrated. So depending on what your passion is and your skill set, um, presumably if you're a farmer, we're wanting to work with you to help document empirically as many of the multi data points as possible about what's going on in your farm. Um, I was having this conversation last night with somebody who was coming from a more of a scientific mindset. And he was like, we have to control the system. We need to have a control and then we have a test, right? Anybody who's been engaged in, you know, science in the past knows this is how you do it. You've got a control and then you've got a test, maybe two tests. Um, and the concept is that you only have one variable. Anybody who's a farmer knows <laughs> that is a ridiculous proposition, right? It's absolutely, it's, it's arrogant. Um, and so what we're envisioning is that Every farm is its own unique ecosystem. We're doing our best job possible to identify the dynamics going on in that ecosystem, overlay that on the dynamics going on in all these other ecosystems, and see if we can formally empirically prove that certain dynamics correlate with better system function. Right? It's, it's not the um, replicated randomized trial model. It's, a, it's, a, it's an ecosystem model of analysis. So, and what, do you, what do you see as the biggest barriers to making the progress you hope to make over the next 12 months? The biggest barriers? Um, probably capital. Uh, money. Yeah, I didn't say this at the beginning. It's not a bad point to end on. Um, we are a uh, dogmatically open source um, endeavor. We're, we're evangelically. Um, um, you know, committed to nothing being for sale. This information, this data is not for sale. The engineering, the design of the tool is not for sale. The app, the data set, nothing will ever be able to be sold to anyone because it's not owned by anyone because it's owned by the commons. And so I've gotten lots of people. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> I've gotten lots of people who've offered millions of dollars in investment capital to be able to lock up this project, and I've told them they can take a hike. Um, so <laughs> that means we don't have millions of dollars <laughs> of operating capital, and we don't need millions of dollars. At least 
you know, maybe over a couple of years we need millions, but um, you know, the, the, the a significant limiting factor is capacity. And you'll hear what we've done, for, and I'm not sure you'll be told how little we've done it for, but um, we've pulled off a hell of a lot so far. And so, you know, we're planning on rolling out a sort of a, you know, who wants to put in $5 a month? Who wants to put in $10 a month? Anybody can afford $500 a month? You know, we think this will be a three to five year project. Um, we think it'll probably cost us $10 million altogether. Um, if you had 20,000 people giving $5 a month, um, which is not a hell of a lot when a planet full of, you know, 7 billion people, um, you know, if you're, if you're giving $1,000 a month, you count for, you know, <laughs> a couple hundred people. Um, you know, we don't need a lot of money, but we do need money. And that is a, a certainly a piece of the puzzle. I don't like to talk about it because I don't like to sort of, I guess, inject reality into the conversation. <laughs> we'll stay in fantasy land about all the amazing things we're doing and then not deal with the fact that we actually have to, have to fund it. But, um, yeah, that is, that is an issue. Um, usually the people who are in attendance at our presentations are not the kind of people who have significant, you know, uh, checkbooks. Some, sometimes they are. But if you know anybody or uh, know anybody who knows anybody, um, please feel very, very free to come up and talk to me um, or various of us who are going to be speaking here today because um, while we don't do the hard sell on capital, we certainly do need it. But other than that, I think we've got an amazing team of people. We've got just the, there are brilliant people of good heart and good mind in all walks of life, in businesses, in um, universities, in organizations, farmers, you know, there's, a, there's an amazing suite of, of brilliant people who get the big picture and are committed. And I feel really strong with those who we have on board. So. I think our capacity is not a limiting factor as far as like the people and the technology and all that kind of stuff. It's just a question of how fast can we move based on the resources we have available to us. Right. All right. One more question and then I'll hand it over to Greg. What's the, so you said a three to five year time frame potentially. Yeah. What's the, the data gathering process and things like that? So you think it'll be three to five years before you actually have something that would be useful consumer ready? Um, so, Again, these are all projections, and you know this has to do with how much money we have coming in. Um, I've been saying, and I keep checking in with Greg every couple of months. Greg, can I still keep saying this? He keeps telling me yes. So, um, I've been saying that we will have a, a a prototype ready for people this year at our conference, um, which is true, and that we'll have a um, a consumer ready tool at our conference next year. Um, we're not going to have a really fancy, sophisticated database, a, a data set, right? This is going to be the first iteration of a, of a standard. So we'll be able to say with a flash of light, look, that is totally watery and full of nitrates. Look, this is totally full of secondary metabolites. Like, we'll be able to do that, I think, without much hassle. Will we be able to parse the 40th percentile from the 50th percentile next year, a year from now? I doubt it. Um, I expect this to be an iterative standard. A process that evolves over time. We'll update the app every six months as we have more information. This is not like an organic standard. Once you're organic, you're organic, right? It's not a binary, you are or are not. It's an iterative evolving standard. So um, I expect that by a year from now, we will have our first consumer calibrated tool ready for market, um, which will be a standalone. Um, my understanding is that if it's not 2020, it's definitely 2021 when the sensor itself can be built or will be built into hundreds of millions of smartphones. And so we won't need to have a standalone tool that is connected to your smartphone and, you know, like it's not, it's not going to be a hassle. It's literally your phone's in your pocket, you pull it out, you flash it at the, at the crop and you get your reading. So that's going to be 2020 or 2021, I think. Um, and so this is going to be an iterative evolving process for us to be able to have enough data and enough, you know, to, to get the um, market adoption for this app to be established, I think will probably take something along those lines, three to five years. Um, and if we are extant still at that point, if we have accomplished what we want to accomplish, um, I hope that we'll be being violently, com you know, competed with by agribusiness. Um, there's going to be a bunch of people who understand what we're doing and are threatened by it. And there's going to be competing apps and there's going to be competing messaging. Um, 
And you know, it's a sign of success when people try to um, replicate what you're doing, right? So, um, you know, let's not have any any. Um, um, I don't know what the word is. Fanciful notions about this going off all entirely peacefully. Um, our our hope is, our intention, our strategy is that we are being, um, we're open to collaborating with anybody who wants to collaborate with us. Anybody that wants to share information, anybody that wants to engage in this metadata, metadata process is more than welcome to engage. Um, it's going to prove, I'm pretty sure, that crops that are jacked up with soluble nitrogen are not nutritious. Crops that have you know, insecticides and fungicides sprayed on them are not nutritious, right? We're going to be tracking the ecosystem effects of carbon sequestration. And when you till the soil, you don't get carbon sequestration. So um, we're going to be basically, um, we're the child who says, look, the emperor's not got no clothes. And we're like, oh, the emperor has no clothes, right? I think that's what, that's what we're doing right here is calling that out um, formally, scientifically, transparently. So. Um, yeah, that's good enough. Thank you all. <laughs> and now the people who are actually doing the work. Greg. <laughs> That's kind of the big picture that everyone gets. Um, there's three pieces to that. There's outreach, so you know, talking to people, explaining to people why it's important, identifying partners that can help us um, collect the data, um, help us collect data both on farms and in stores, um, um, developing the partnerships so that when we're ready to scale, we can do so, all that kind of stuff. Um, there's also lab testing, so in order to understand um, nutrient density, we, we have to measure it. And at this point, a lab is the only way to do it. So we do do a lot of lab testing, and I'll, I'll walk through why we do that and uh, why we chose that strategy. And then also technology development. So in the long term, we want to be able to measure nutrient density um, in an easier way, and that means we have to develop some technology, or at least we have to calibrate technology that exists. <coughs> So I'm going to talk about these two parts. This, these are the parts that we focus on. So, um, so I, I, I want to work through this kind of backwards, because that's how we did. Um, starting with the thing that we want to do, and walking our way back to how the hell we're going to do it. So um, we, this is the idea that, that's really sexy, and everyone kind of immediately gets, and gets people like up and, and moving around and, and excited. How do we measure nutrient density on farms and in stores? Right? Everyone gets that this is compelling, that it would have significant impacts on the market, or at least we think that. Um, and um, that's sort of what everybody wants. Uh, but it's kind of a question of like, how do we do that? How do we get there? Our answer to that question was we probably need to build some kind of a tool, some kind of a device that can do that. And we came to that conclusion by looking at a wide range of technologies that were available and the strategies that we could apply. And we felt like that was that was probably our best bet. And we felt that way because um, we can use spectroscopy. And there's a lot of research showing that spectroscopy might be able to um, correlate to the nutritional parameters in food that we're interested in. But kind of as Dan alluded to, spectroscopy 
doesn't just like give you the answer. It just gives you like a messy line. This is not a real line, this is just me drawing. <laughs> but it looks basically like this. Um, so you can't just take this and, it, it, and I think there's a little bit of confusion. I really, every, every time I talk, I want to demystify it. Like, um, you know, if I, if I put food coloring in water, then I would get one nice little peak, and I would say that peak relates to the concentration of food coloring in water. And we could predict food coloring concentrations all day long, and that would be, that would be awesome. But that's not reality. So uh, the reality is that the type of information we want to know about, things like antioxidants and secondary metabolites and all this other stuff, it doesn't make one nice peak. Like, sorry. If it did, like, we've been doing this for years. It makes a bunch of confusing, messy peaks. Um, it doesn't mean that the information isn't necessarily there, but it means that it's not visibly obvious. So, um, so we can't just make a device and give you a peak and call it a day. So we have to make a calibrated device, right? Um, uh, and that means we have to have a model to calibrate the device. We have to have a model that says, when the, when the peak shifts this way and there's this, these other pieces of information, we can be reasonably confident that the nutritional value is X. Um, and that, that we can't do with our eyes, we have to do that with the model. So we're trying to build a calibrated device. It's a really, really key component. So how do we build the model? Oh shit, now we gotta collect a bunch of data. That's, there's a lot of work there. Um, and for the types of models that we want to build and the level of complexity, we probably need to collect a pretty significant amount of data. Um, and um, we can't just, so what does that data look like? There's three primary components to that data. There's the, Metadata, so like, uh, let's say I have a carrot, what do I want to know about this carrot in order to be able to build that model, in order to be able to calibrate that device, in order to be able to measure nutrient density. I need to, I want some metadata, so I want to know like, what variety is it, maybe. I mean, that's an important factor. Um, maybe I want to know what store was it from, or what brand was it from, or what time of year, you know, was it, was it collected, how long has it been in storage, um, those sorts of information, that's the metadata. We need that. We also need um, um, the spectral data, so we need to scan it. Kind of a question there, do we scan the surface? Do we shade it first? Do we chop it up? Like, we can't need a process there. And then the last piece is, in order to build the model, we also need actual lab data. <coughs> so we need to take this care to a lab, and we need to measure actual um, you know, antioxidants, polyphenols, minerals, whatever it is that we think the definition of nutrition is, we need to measure those things. So once you have those three buckets, the metadata, the spectral data, and the lab data, then we can go build ourselves a model, or at least try. <laughs> so so there's a big piece there. And that's what we spend a really good portion of the year um, testing to say, can we build data to, build, to, to make a model, does that model? work in some way, shape, or form. So then we decided, well, I guess we gotta build a lab. Um, and you might say, gee, Greg, that's kind of like, why? Like, there's a lot of labs in the world. Um, why don't you just use a lab? Well, we, we quoted this stuff out, and it was quite expensive to do in a lab. We don't have some, we don't have some, like, magical thing in our lab that makes us cheaper than everybody else. So um, there's a lot of great labs out there that do great stuff. The reason that we can be cheaper is because in our lab, we take eight tests every time, the same, and we can optimize it like crazy, right? Um, it's kind of like if you make Christmas cookies every Christmas, like the 30th time, you're really, really good at it, like better than somebody doing it the first time, same idea. So based on the fact that we can optimize our process, and the fact that we knew that we were gonna change the process over time, we wanted to be able to update the methods that we were using and learn and stuff, and just trying to interact with outside lab it to make sense. So we decided to do that internally. So, unfortunately, uh, we built a lab. <laughs> um, it's turned out to be good, though. Um, so I'm gonna, it's somewhat of a restatement of what Dan said, but I think it's really important. Um, the piece that's not clear here in our, in the sort of logic of 
how we got to where we got to was transparency um, and how absolutely critical it is to what we're doing. Um, so everything that we do is open source, all the data and the device, um, as well as all the software, um, which, which helps data move through this process. Um, and I, I just want to take a second to explain why that's so important. Um, we have learned in the last 15 years that um, data is not just data. I'm guessing 15 years ago if I told you, hey, you know like Facebook, that cool new site you're on, and like how it's free and like connects to your friends, well, in 15 years you might not be so happy that you decided to jump on that bandwagon. You'd be like, eh, eh, no big deal. But it is a big deal. Uh, and we are about to move into a world where um, it's not about social data anymore. Right? Like, what used to be, we are, we are 15 years ago, 15 years ago social data is what the physical data in our world is today. In 15 years we're going to be collecting that amount of physical, world, physical data about our world, and a lot of it's going to be very personal, and a lot of it is going to, the same way that our social data feeds back into recommendations and suggestions and everything, uh, the physical data about our world is going to be the exact same thing. So, you could say, and I would say this, absolutely. You could say, well, you know what? The technology's coming. Like in five years, someone's just going to build this, and you're going to be able to buy it from Apple, and they're going to be like, go, if you've heard of Sio, like, they, they didn't work out, but like in five years, you know, like, you're going to be able to go buy it and point it at a carrot, and it's going to tell you what's good or not. You're going to say, like, why do we have to do this as a community and spend up the time and all this nonsense? And my answer is because in that future where you buy this black box and you have two carrots and you point it at one and the other and the black box says this carrot's better and they don't show you the model and they don't show you the data, yeah. how do you know? How do you know? And it's usually not as blatant as like producer of carrot A paid company to say carrot A is better. It's not usually the way it works. It's usually producer of carrot A provided a large donation to the foundation which provides the definition of nutrition. And the definition of nutrition is now based around the variety of carrot that, that producer A makes, right? Which is high carotenoids but low something else. And now all of a sudden the definition of nutrition means that carrot A always wins. You're not gonna know. So, like, I, I just, whatever, whatever happens in the next five years, please, Please demand of your technological products that they provide you with data and models and openness. Please. This, this, or anything else. So transparency is important. All right. So what do we do? What happens here? Well, we built the lab, uh, and in building that lab, we um, developed and got good at a set of methods. As Dan said, they are not the be-all, end-all set of methods. Um, and um, that's one of the things that we really want from you guys is engagement on people who have expertise in labs and <coughs> nutrition and stuff to try to improve our process. But I'm going to walk through what we do. So um, basically, we got a bunch of samples of carrots and spinach. That's really, you're going to be talking a lot about carrots today. <laughs> and you're going to be making a lot of long term implications about what we learned from carrots. And I'm sorry for that, but that's what we got. Um, and so when a carrot sample came in, we measured the reflectance using the reflectometer. So this little widget had like flash of thing up there. Um, we also measured the supernatant. So it's a little hard to see, but basically you do a carrot extraction. So you mush the carrot down uh, and then you mix it with some methanol and water. And then um, the solid part goes to the bottom and the other stuff floats to the top. So you end up with methanol and water and anything that's water soluble in a carrot on the top, and that's called supernatant after you centrifuge it. So we also did um, a spectral scan on the uh, that spectra of the supernatant. Um, and then we also did a series of sort of standard tests. So antioxidants, polyphenols, um, which includes um, like aromatic compounds and other secondary metabolites, proteins, and then minerals using XRF, and that's everything from sodium all the way up to heavy metals like lead. Not every single one, and that changed but a lot. So when we got a carrot, we measured all this stuff. 
And when we got soil, um, we measured all this stuff. So we measured total organic carbon, um, carbon mineralization. So soil respiration, if you're familiar with uh, like Solvita, um, where you get a CO2 burst, basically, it tells you, in a rough sense, biological activity in the soil. And then same thing, minerals using XRF. So this is what we built out in the lab. So that, this, this, was, this took a while. Um, by the end, we were able to do about 40 to 60 samples per week. And one sample is one carrot and two bags of soil. Because we would take a carrot and then 0 to 6 inches soil next to it and 6 to 12 inches soil next to it. So that's one sample. Um, we could do 40 to 60 a week with one person in the lab. And the cost is about 50 to 100 bucks per sample once we got good at it. Just, which is pretty damn cheap. Okay, so we built a lab. Um, we collected some data. We actually didn't collect very much data. These guys collected a massive amount of data. So, um, so we created something called the Data Partners Program. And basically, that was people who were willing to um, collect somewhere between six to 18 samples per week, go to two to three stores or farms, and follow roughly at least an experimental design. So, like, we don't just want you to go to your backyard and pick a new carrot every week. Like, that doesn't give us the, the like diversity of sample to be able to say very much meaningful at the end. And it means that people really had to drive around and go to stores they wouldn't necessarily normally go to to get samples. Uh, and they just like did an amazing job. So, in the totality of the work that was done, a huge portion of the work was done by. Um, the people here, everybody here submitted at least one sample, some submitted a lot, like Ellen and Chris submitted massive numbers of samples. Um, and I just want to like really give them a round of applause for the work that they did. Um, so, like I said, this was, this was what it is they were sending in. They were sending in a carrot or spinach sample, and then they were sending in two salt samples. So let's Look at some stuff. Sending in the carrot samples was it organic, conventional, yep. right from a farm? From a farm, I mean everywhere. Yep. Okay. So the experimental design was basically farm. I'm sorry, uh, grocery store, farmers market, and farm. Those are the sort of three options there. And then this is general, and the <coughs> feedback was good on this: conventional, organic, like certified organic and then regenerative, where regenerative was kind of like a pile. It wasn't super clear, and that's something that we need to verify for next year and approve is defining that. But I think uh, we got pretty broad numbers across this way. So, um, so, so, so we built a big software platform for managing all this data. So basically, you collect the data on phone, that goes to the same website that all the data that we collect on the lab goes to, and everything goes there like immediately. So as soon as a new sample is submitted and we do it, it ends up here and it updates this, um, all this information, which is all publicly viewable. So if you want to go see this, um, we will also put it in a final report. Um, we haven't processed all the samples, so we're not done with that. But I would strongly suggest, and I'm sure we will send it out to BFA emails. Um, to look at that final report, because that's kind of more accurate information than we're going to be able to provide you today. But, um, but anyway, you can go look at this, you can download the data yourself, and it's pretty neat. So we sent out over a thousand mailers, which contained um, six bags each. So we sent a lot out, and we got almost 600 back. Um, so we, it was a lot of samples. Um, probably half of those included soil. So here's the data collected by state. So 106 samples from New York, 183 from Michigan, 67 from Connecticut. There's some missing here because I know that we had some from Vermont. Um, but this gives, just gives you a general sense as well as Pennsylvania of where stuff came from. 
We surveyed 55 stores across that, um, that range. This gives you a sense of the activity. So this is like um, surveys taken, so basically samples collected. We, we really, this was like, everything before here was a lot of learning, learning. <laughs> and we lost a lot of samples, and got lost in the mail, they bought it in the mail, we, you know, we didn't have our lab process down right, but basically somewhere in like mid-August we kind of really, like things started to gel, and from here on out, um, the samples looked pretty good. So that was one big thing from this year, it was just like learning how to set this stuff up, getting everything ready, um, it was quite the process. If you are a data person, you can come to this website and literally download the CSV, which contains all the information, all the soil information and food information, all in one nice big spot. It's not a mess. We've already cleaned it up for you. We've taken out the bad data points. We've eliminated unnecessary columns. Um, it's all there. So, um, in addition, you can see the variable names and descriptions, so you're not like, what's TG underscore five? It's like, it means this. So. Please, please don't do that. Definition of terms. This is the stuff we already talked about, um, just in, in terms of the things that we're actually measuring, what they are with some, with some details. And um, this was just our attempt to try to classify, in a rough sense, people who um, uh, weren't doing any sort of biological method, so they were you know, they tilled and they didn't use cover crops and, you know, anything like that. So that would be like conventional. It's like no, no biological related um, activities. Whereas lots of bio is things like um, there are no till, they use cover crops, there are no spray, um, they use biological amendments, etc., etc., etc. So again, we had about 600 samples, but we, we, we've only processed about 240. We literally have about 200 samples like sitting in the freezer. So we tried really hard to get them all done, but it just takes a long time. So it'll take another couple of weeks before we complete all the samples. So just be aware that this is not, um, this is preliminary. But here's what I really wanted to show you, besides just showing you that we have this out there and you can go see it. I want to talk about variation. So one of the first questions we're trying to answer in this survey is, what, what is the level of variation in the general food supply? Um, so let's just walk through a couple of things that we measured. So soil respiration, this is the Solvita Lake test um, for soil in the top six inches, zero to 15 centimeters. It's 125 samples from all those seven, six states. And you can see it's, it's quite a wide distribution, right? You go all the way down from a value of four up to a value of 40. So it's a tenfold difference from one location to another in terms of um, respiration or biological activity. Does the age of the sample have anything to do with respiration? If, you know, say it it's coming from Iowa and it's had it over a weekend, you know, at the post office and it didn't get into lab until Monday and processed until Wednesday? It should not. It shouldn't, um, because actually we dry them all out before we run the test anyway. They all get dried, not like in an oven, like 100 degrees, but just air dry. So you have to sit them around for a couple of days air drying anyway. We have done some tests and basically a week, two weeks, three weeks doesn't really make a big difference. So I think this is like legit result. So there is a lot of variation. Um, and you'll see a little bit of why that is. Um, so here's the total organic carbon again in the top six inches, a lot of variation. So it goes all the way from almost none, like 1% mineral, mineral soils, all the way out to 12%, which almost guaranteed that's someone's dumped a bunch of compost or something like there. It's like hard to get that without adding stuff. So um, recognizing that this is not just carbon built solely by plants in the ground on that location, but it gives you a sense of the, the, the variability in total organic carbon across um, carrots. your y-axis and your x-axis? Sorry, thank you. So this is a histogram. So the x-axis is the, the, the thing at the top, the total organic carbon as a percent. And the y-axis is just the number of samples that were in that range. And that's true for the, the next series of graphs that I'm going to show you. So this is saying, like, uh, 
there are there was eight samples that had around one percent total organic carbon, and there was like one sample that had twelve and a half percent. I'm going to skip through the um, six to twelve layers, but it's some repeats. Okay, so let's pick through some of the nutritional data. And again, I'm going to talk about carrots because we got a lot more carrots than spinach. So <laughs> this is what it is. Um, so polyphenols, uh, this is a secondary metabolite. This is kind of a big classification, but it's nice because it gives you a general sense. Um, you got samples all the way from zero, essentially, with one way up here at 25. So again, a lot of variation, a lot of variation. Um, and this is out of 208 samples, both from stores and farms and farms. Protein, carrot's not really known for being a high protein thing, but um, there's definitely variation there too, though not as much. This is the one that's sort of the biggest for me. So antioxidants, a huge amount of variation. So as low as somewhere between zero and five, there's three samples. And even within sort of the bulk, you know, even not going out to these outliers, you're still talking about you know, 100 to 1, from 1 to 100 to 120, um, in terms of antioxidants, yeah. Have you been testing hydroponic food? Um, we didn't mark that as, we, we got feedback to mark it, but we didn't mark it this year. Just out of curiosity, if you did test it, just in general, did you have any insights? We, we didn't know which ones were hydroponic and which ones weren't. So, we, so just to, like a little backstory. Because this data was collected from a variety of sources, we couldn't ask tons of detailed questions about farm practice. We asked very simple questions like, is this field no till? You know, did you use cover crops this year? Did you use biological amendments? I mean, just a series of simple questions. But that's something that you'll see, I think, for next year, we can, we can make a lot of progress on improving. Marker on um, for all three examples on the y-axis. Is that for the same pair? Which one? Right there. And then in the previous two screens. No, these would be all different parents. I think he's asking. So you know one out. Oh, I don't know. <coughs> <laughs> well, you know what you should do? You should go download the CSV and sort by antioxidants, and the top three will be the three carrots. So yeah, you can check it out. Question. Yeah. So did you, the sample size you said was how big? 203. 203. And earlier you said you did a, you had 546 participating or something like that. Is this, can you just tell us a little bit about that? Yep. So um, we had 600 total samples that we received. Of all, when, all types. Of all types. Which all types is just carrots and spinach. If you're talking about produce, yeah. We just, 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 just did two. Yep. Um, but yeah, we received 600. Some of them we either screwed up or we, we didn't have a process in place like in early July, August. Yep. Um, so there's a little bit of loss there. Some of them are spinach, which is not accounted for here, right? So there's take off another 75. Um, and then we probably have a 200 sitting in the freezer. <clears throat> so is that's why we're not. So like next year and over time, is you build your network? Will increase the sample size and have more empirical data. That's what, yeah. That's what. Um, so spinach, spinach is a very similar story. Again, if you look at polyphenols, you've got you've got you got polyphenols going from four to sixty, but even sort of within the main part of the distribution, up to forty, so a tenfold variation. Um, protein's not super interesting, but antioxidants, same thing. You've got spinach close to a thousand. You got spinach close to hundred. So. I guess, put simply, to answer the question, is there variability in the food supply? Uh, yes, quite a bit, quite a bit. Okay, so the next set of slides I'm just gonna show you is preliminary, nothing, so you're gonna see a bunch of bar graphs. Don't interpret anything from it, I'm just, I just need you to, just data. just data, there's no error bars on any of this stuff. Um, and we have more work to do to figure it out. It's just to give you a sense of roughly where things lie, um, but there's nothing, um, what's the right term? Significant versus? Substantial. Thank you, sir. So there's nothing substantial 
in comparing these. Um, it's just to give you a sense of what we can show. So, you know, this is like antioxidants um, compared across people who don't use biological management practices versus people who do. Um, there are some differences, but they are not, um, they're neither significant nor particularly substantial. And when we get the last 200 samples, then we will firm this off and we will put in a final report with error bars and stuff. Um, so, um, so we'll, we'll I, I want to skip, skip over that because we can go through that once we have it all. Um, I think there's some interesting graphs here towards the end. This is kind of just validating for us as a lab. Um, antioxidants and polyphenols. Polyphenols contain lots of things that are antioxidants, so they should roughly correlate and they do roughly correlate, like more polyphenols generally produces more antioxidants. Um, so that's good to see, just sort of as validation. Same thing here with soil respiration and total organic carbon. Probably higher carbon soils are going to produce more biological activity. Um, so that's kind of generally what you see. So. Um, so this is so so this is the last piece that I wanted to show. These are all of the spectral scans. I apologize, the x-axis here should actually be wavelengths from the this would be the UV range, 365 nanometers, over to near infrared about 940 nanometers. But it just shows the numbers. But just be aware that's what the x-axis is here. It's the wavelength. So we did two scans using this device which is just sort of a like, relatively inexpensive, simple spectrometer. Um, this one is the surface scan. So we took a carrot. Um, we needed the, the top to be flat, because we needed to be flush with the light down here. So we um, just shaved it down flat. And we set it on the light guide, and then we measure. So we flash lights, see how much light comes back, and that's how you get the spectral scan at different wavelengths. Okay, so that's the carrot surface. You can see it's like pretty, it's pretty messy and noisy. That's spectrum. We did an, another scan. We did another scan. Um, but on this one, we did it on the extracted carrot. So we took the carrot, we chopped it up, we mixed it with some methanol and water, and then we we took off the methanol portion, which had now absorbed a bunch of the carrot juice, and we measured that in a cuvette, like this. Um, like this. So imagine this had carrot juice, not carrot juice, but um, supernina, and so you would just measure that like this. Same device. Um, and that's what this scan looks like. So this is actually kind of more interesting because you can see there's certain wavelengths where you get a lot of variation, and there's certain wavelengths where things are pretty consistent. And just as someone who's been doing this for a while, like I was like, hmm, that's a little bit like more interesting. Maybe there's a little bit more predictive stuff. So that's that. So that, that's basically the um, data so far. We will have like the final report. Um, we also did um, soil spectra. We use that to predict. Um, total carbon, um, which, is, which we're getting pretty good at, getting better at. So those are the results. Is there any, I don't want to go into like tons of details, are there any like clarifying questions on these results before we keep going? Yep. What, what were you surprised by when you looked at everything? What really jumped, because I'm sure you assumed there was going to be a lot of variability. But was there something that you, when you looked at all the data, you said, wow, this is something I'm really surprised by or didn't expect? Um, well, actually, what I, so I, I made no assumptions. I think that's a different, like, our job is to make no assumptions. So I didn't make any assumptions. So I, I was actually pretty surprised by the amount of variability, especially in the accidents. Um, I expected, actually, that to be tighter. Um, and I think one of the things that we'll do for the final board is um, the USDA actually maintains a, like a database of, and, you know, here's what antioxidants should be in carrots, and they give you a standard deviation for that based on the sample size that they take every 10 to 15 years. I'd be really curious to take that data and compare it to ours. 
Um, because my guess is they didn't they didn't go to like a wide range of places as we did. I'm not sure of it. Um, so I'd be curious to see how we compare. So that was surprising to me. Um, I think to your point and my wrap up before I hand it over to um, Christian to, to talk about the statistical analysis and other outcomes is to say one of the key questions. So one of the key questions that we had was, is there a big impact of farm practice, so regenerative practices, at least in the simple way that we asked it, on food quality, again, in the simple way that we measured it, in carrots? That's super specific, but that's where we're at. Um, the answer is probably not, right? Um, we don't have a really good concrete answer. But in the universe of regenerative practices produce infinitely better carrots, or conventional practices produce infinitely better carrots, the answer is probably not here and probably not here. So probably somewhere in here. Uh, and as we get more samples and we do more analysis through in the next month or two in the final report, we'll try to refine that a bit more, but we're probably somewhere in here. What's, what's interesting to me about that is we see two sort of opposing pieces of information. We see a huge amount of variability, and we see that none of the questions we really asked informed us about that variability. So that sort of like begs the question, like, we obviously are asking the wrong questions, um, or we're not collecting sufficient amount of data, or something. So that's, yeah. <coughs> so you have, Sorry, back there, just one and then you So you made, if you talked about this already, but you have three variables. You have the farmer, you have the soil, and you have the food. What the farmer does, what's in the soil, and what the food shows up with. Yeah. What I haven't seen yet in this this morning is, I hear you're asking people to send in soil. It also seems like you're taking samples from stores and others that didn't have soil. Correct. How, how are you tying in the data from the soil to what you just describe as, as seeking that answer? Only a subset of samples had farm data, so when, we, when, I, when I give that perspective, I can only provide the perspective from farm samples, samples that we collected from farms. So yeah, here, and then, and then I want to keep moving because um, we will have time for questions, so let's just, just do the last couple of questions and then go. We had discussions about use of uh, <coughs> point, point source for the fruits and develop for uh, Forms, various forms of microscopy, the light and dark field microscopy to analyze light and soil and other variables. No, we'd love to do that. And that's one of the things at the end, if you have, let me respond to it at the end, because we'd actually love to expand our repertoire we're measuring to improve, to answer that variability question. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, discover. We were. And you'll soon discover toxins keep nutrients from coming through, right? I, I don't know. <laughs> but if you put ozone in some fruit, it'll take it, oxidize the toxin. You will get some mineral levels coming back. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you discovered that or not. We haven't, but that's a perfect example of, of something. I, I'm, one of the last slides, I'm sort of like making a desperate plea for collaborations. So these are like great examples. We are totally open to that. Like, let's run some tests next year if you're willing to either do a controlled trial or if we have observational information, we can try to test like a claim like that or if we can add a component to our sample process that can help answer these questions that remain unanswered, like, let's do it. Doesn't it work the same way in human health? If you're toxic, it'll keep nutrients that you swallow from coming through. I agree. Yeah. Ask, ask people with opinions. I don't, I don't have a chance. <laughs> I want to make sure that Christian has a, has a chance and then have a chance to wrap up because I think he has some to share as well. Um, my name is Christian Oland, and um, some of you may know my sister Mario, and she's been learning and 
um, enjoying this community for a number of years, and she finally persuaded me to, uh, to get involved, and I am doing so in this collaboration with uh, Dan and Greg and, and others. I want to just mention that I was educated as an ecologist studying population dynamics and demographic modeling and that sort of thing. Uh, eventually, about 15 years ago, I decided it was more important to me to live in Vermont than to pursue an academic career. And so I've been working as a statistical consultant since then. And again, this is kind of the capacity that I'm involved with this collaboration. And I guess I want to emphasize two things. One is the pre preliminary nature of what we're talking about. And I want to latch on to what Dan and um, Greg have already mentioned about um, transparency and using open source technology and so on and so forth. Um, I'm using open source statistics software. My code is on uh, GitHub for Greg and I to be able to collaborate on it. Um, but the transparency is certainly really important. Um, So as Greg just described, a, an ambition is to be able to predict carrot quality or generally vegetable food quality from um, easily accessible data. And we've latched onto the idea of using spectrometry to, to get some at least more easily obtained data. And um, kind of a top line summary of what I'm about to show you is that the spectral data taken from supernatant, from the extracted carrot, are per um, providing some positive predictive results, more so at this point than the readouts taken directly from the carrots. I've got a couple of um, screens here where I'm going to show you, kind of on, on your left, a, an example of a, a poor correlation between a model prediction and, uh, um, and a measure, measurements of carrot quality, and on the right, a, a better uh, correlation. And to explain what I've done here is I've taken the samples that we have. Um, I think it's 140, 158 orange carrots. I've taken 144 out of them, used that to um, select a model. It's a multiple regression model, but it, it decides what terms from the spectral um, data are important estimates the parameters of the model, and then tries to make a prediction for, for 14 carrots that were withheld. I've done that um, over and over again a thousand times under uh, two conditions to say, you know, if you get a bunch of data, use it to fit a model from some carrots, can you predict what a new population of carrots are like based on the spectral data? Um, here are the two, the poor on the left, the pretty good on the right examples just examples that I picked out by eye from the, directly from the carrot stands. And I think you'll see when I switch to the next screen that especially on the right hand side, the correlation gets to be a little bit stronger. And that's what Greg already alluded to, that at this point, the, the quality of data that we get from the carrot extract is, is a little bit better than what we can measure directly from the carrot itself. And then here is um, kind of a, a table showing um, Kind of when the model predictions were right, it predicted that a carrot was a good quality carrot in terms of antioxidants, um, polyphenols, and protein, versus it predicted it was a poor carrot. Um, you've got true, positive, and negative, and then the two kinds of mistakes you can make. You can say that it, you can predict that it was a not a good carrot and be wrong because it was good, or you can predict that it was a good carrot and be wrong because it actually wasn't good. And so, um, for the supernatant, for the carrot extract, we're getting a, a pretty good predictive value, both in, both in terms of positive predictive value and negative predictive value. And that's just um, you know, better at this point than what we can get directly measuring from the carrots. And you know, I think that the ambition is that ultimately we can um, achieve some process improvements to try to make this also a, a more predictive uh, relationship. So that was um, kind of a quick picture of where we're at again in this preliminary analysis for the, the ultimate goal of kind of taking easy measurements to get um, predictions of, of vegetable quality. Um, 
And as Greg already alluded to, we in our, well, Greg really, in the, the team, um, in collecting the survey data, they collected a bunch of data about the, um, the farm practices being implemented. And in that it um, has error bars. I also mentioned that I um, transformed the data using logarithms in general for a lot of biological data, a lot of abundances and densities and concentrations. It's, it's appropriate to um, take a lot of transformation of the data before looking at it. And as Greg showed, a lot of the distributions have a long tail to the right, and the logarithmic transformation makes that a more symmetrical bell-shaped curve. Um, but with that kind of technical detail aside, in general, the um, information that we have about farm practices is not predictive of, in this case, polyphenols measured in carrots um, or other measures of carrot quality. And what I would say about that is that probably what's going on is that um, whatever signal may be there is, is obscured by all the noise that's um, brought into our measurements by, by things that aren't recorded or aren't observed. Um, you know, not that there's no hope that farm practices um, could yield insights. Um, and actually, back to something that Dan alluded to, it's kind of deliberate that we're not doing randomized trials. And I, you know, I would say if we would take a collection of um, farm plots and apply to them at random certain practices, that's the way that you could get um, information about them the benefits or lack of benefits from the different farm practices, but it's kind of, um, that's not the agenda here. And I'd say it's not surprising that those other sources of variability are obscuring the information that, that may be in, in the data set. Okay. And then I also wanted to talk a little bit about kind of taking things further back in terms of the, the processes, about what we're measuring from the soil and how that correlates with what's in the vegetables. And again, um, I'm going to show a kind of a series of panels, so let me just explain what, each, what the general layout is. This one happens to be for potassium, but on the left I've got the correlation in the uh, measured concentration of the element in the, um, the deeper soil. I think I've just turned this off somehow because I don't have a pointer anymore either. Anyway, this is the concentration um, in the 15 to 30 centimeters deep correlated with the sample taken from the shallow soil. So in general, you're going to see in these panels there's a one-to-one -one correlation. Departures from that dashed line give you some insight into in how the soil may have been modified, particularly the shallow soil. On the right is the correlation between this variable, the, the element measured in the shallow soil, and that same element measured in the, um, in the vegetable. And um, <coughs> potassium, we have a pretty good correlation in the observed concentration in the vegetable compared to the soil. Here's an example of you know, virtually no correlation, or yeah, I should just say there is no correlation between phosphorus measured in the vegetables and measurements taken from the soil. Thinking again about the departures from this dashed line, you have some instances where the shallow soil has elevated phosphorus compared to the deeper soil. And I think that that basically makes perfect sense. Here's an example of calcium, where the carrot is probably regulating how much calcium is deposited in its, in its tissues. Um, these plots, each of them has, in this case, it's one, two, three doublings on the x-axis and three doublings on the y-axis. So you can see that in terms of the soil, it's actually something like four doublings of variability in calcium concentration, but only two doublings in the vegetable tissues themselves. And then for something like iron, it's actually the opposite pattern. There's more variability in the carrots than there is in the soils that they're grown in. To be a statistician, I just wanted to mention a couple of perspectives that I have on 
working with data while, I'm, while I have this audience. Um, the first point is related certainly to the transparency and openness, namely to use reproducible scripts. You know, if, if I've done a process, I want to be able to show Greg how I did it and let him replicate it, even let him tweak it and manipulate it. And I'm programming a um, statistical environment called R, an open source um, <coughs> statistical environment. I think it's really important um, for transparency to use technology like that. I believe you know, strongly in looking at graphs of data while trying to figure out how to model the data. Those two things work together interactively um, in terms of getting insights from data. I think it's really important to account for the sampling structure in a data set. And I think you know, basically we ought to think more about what the sampling process has been, whether we're getting um, unaccounted for forms of you know, correlation and how we could account for them. There's a class of models that are called mixed effect models that we ought to be um, trying to incorporate into this process. And it occurred to me at the beginning, I was gonna make this point that we want information, not data. There are a lot of data sets now that contain no information, and what we really want is the information. There's gotta be some analogy with, where the information is like a vegetable, and uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff growing in a field that isn't vegetable, and that's, probably analogous to the, um, the noise that's in the data. Really what we want is information. So up to the top right, um, it's very important not to throw away information when you're working with a data set. And that's something that does happen when you take a continuously measured variable and classify it. So for example, if, if we were to take the measurements of antioxidants, polyphenols, and protein, and say that these are high, these are medium, and these are low, or these are good quality, these are fair, and these are poor. Whenever you do a step like that, you throw away information, which is certainly contrary to the, um, you know, the principle of, that we want to get information. I already mentioned that it's appropriate to use logarithmic transformation, and then the last point is probably too technical, I won't dwell on it. Um, I wanna, I'll probably just stay up here, but I wanna hand it back to you because I think uh, it'd be better for you to um, at least be up here to answer any questions that are that come up. Um, so, um, so we do have um, all the parts for 300 of these things ordered. We still have. Um, we've also um, developed the tutorials and some experiments. So, if, again, like Dan said, he said absolutely right. Um, this is a developer device. If you want to get antioxidants and a carrot tomorrow, you should not buy it. Please don't buy this, because then you're going to be bugging me about antioxidants and carrots, and I don't have an answer for you. Um, but if you want to help us develop the kind of techniques that we're talking about up here, if you want to help try to do classifications in things like milk or in vegetables so that we can learn for next year, hey, we actually can see differences between brand or between variety, that will help us immensely in doing statistical analysis on the lab data. Um, so your work is really valuable, but it's a developer device. Um, so that's the details on that. And then I guess in terms of this year, if we go all the way back up to the top of the logic of what we're doing, can we measure nutrient density? And I want to I wanna make sure to pull out, I think, a key piece of what Christian um, pointed out there. Basically, what we found is if I have two carrots, one is high in nutrient density and one is low. I'm just classifying into two buckets. If I have two carrots, uh, or if I have two carrots and I pull out one, and I say, guess which one is good, and they're both orange and you can't tell the difference, what's your chance of guessing good or bad? 50-50, right? So basically what we found using spectral data only, right? Spectral data only, no metadata, um, was that with the model, we can predict 74% of the time which one's good and which one is bad. Like, I, I know you're not gonna like call home to mom about that. Like, that doesn't sound that exciting, but I'm just telling you, it's really freaking exciting. <laughs> that is really exciting. And, and, we, and, and initially, I was, I was, when we first ran the model, we had some purple and white, white carrots in there, and it's like, okay, maybe we're just predicting purple carrots because purple carrots are gonna have higher antioxidants, and that's like cheating. So we took out all the purple carrots. Orange carrots, can't tell the difference. 74% prediction. So it, it means we are not where we want to be, but it means that like 
that like something's there. And um, given that this was our first year and we messed a lot of stuff up and we did things not as good as we could, and we have a lot of areas of improvement, both, both from a statistical perspective and from a method development perspective and from an experimental design perspective, I think we are in um, good shape to say we are going down a reasonable path. Uh, because as wonderful as it is that we have you know, the, sort of the USDA uh, in, engaged in it, often they move slowly uh, and we need confidence. And it's, I just want to reemphasize, again, we wouldn't be here without the GOAT, the, the, the GOAT community that's represented and led uh, partly by uh, our side and, uh, and this community. So uh, I just want to, I can't say that enough, uh, that uh, the potential for this is, uh, is being, it, and the confidence in saying and in creating this vision has really uh, been led by folks in this group. So we're now actualizing this, uh, again, this Open Team project uh, with, uh, in cooperation with the Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research uh, in developing uh, this, uh, this plan, it's a, it's a five-year uh, process of where we have a community of practice that can, is ready to scale nationally and even and globally. Um, and it starts with uh, the basic infrastructure, creating the core modules, one of which are these observation modules, uh, and then moving into a process of developing hub farms for in-field testing. Uh, and using existing farmer networks to begin this human-centered design process, this process of taking this underlying logic and making it useful and making it uh, accessible uh, at uh, farm levels, of, uh, farms at different scales, in different production systems, uh, and in different geographies and in different languages. Uh, and then we move to uh, creating new projects and a platform that can adapt to the next generation of technology, because one thing we know is that it's changing quickly. So we don't want to, we want to build a system that promotes innovation and and, uh, uh, and creates essentially an innovation economy based on an open source core platform. Um, and that we're, as we're creating these new economies, we're paying for uh, the innovation and implementation, not on the underlying science. And, and not for protection uh, of intellectual property. So, uh, so year one, we're going to be we're uh, working on uh, a shared software utility services. All of those tools, and at, down to the farm level, share a lot of uh, requirement for a lot of the same information. A large portion of which is actually free, uh, and but not accessible. And so this is really important to do the kind of AI work and put it into context and interpret it. Um, and uh, taking the kinds of data that were, are going to be collected at the farm level, what, how did that vegetable, how did that crop grow, what conditions did it actually grow in, and combine that with the lab data or the device data. And so this is high resolution climate weather data, dynamic soils information, uh, this is crop species, uh, a standard way of dealing with uh, describing crop species and how we describe the inputs that went into that uh, crop and providing a way of placing that in context, a geodata explorer, a way to create dynamic maps that are making all of that data useful at the farm level. And it, for each of these, our partner is a partner that's already meeting and has a, a part of it. So it's not inventing it, it's taking what exists and, and stitching them together and then making it a service that anybody who's interested can then access uh, that. And then start a, a, a um, develop a mobile and web-based uh, way, uh, a farm object that, that uh, will describe farms in a way that, uh, that can be compared across production systems and create a common interface that's coherent across uh, different tools and a kit, again, not to set it in stone, but to provide the tools uh, that use the uh, utility services, and then uh, begin the process of linking the, the large-scale climate models together, um, and moving towards uh, adding things like economic pricing and discoveries uh, into, uh, into the system in the second year, and beginning to test these uh, systems across uh, the, the exchange and handshakes between the tools in the second year and moving more 
towards uh, agreements for data sharing across the platform. So uh, being able to have a method for recognizing the value that farmers and others who are participating in putting data in, can, their input can be valued and recognized, and we can provide uh, credit. Um, so third year, we move much more towards uh, this process of scaling and implementing uh, the infield in field testing and building the network and getting it ready for a uh, wider scale uh, distribution uh, across uh, across communities and supply chains and uh, government and uh, uh, use. Um, so essentially, uh, the on the ground, what it looks like on the ground is in the first year working with a core set of farms around the country in diverse production systems that will be implementing and testing and providing not just data uh, from the farm, environmental data, but also feedback on how the process actually works for collecting and using the kinds of tools that, uh, uh, that uh, you've seen uh, demonstrated and talked about today. Uh, and, and getting the, the process of what does it look like? How do we start to do in uh, uh, on-farm research well? What does that process look like? How do we build the tools to support that process? Uh, and then moving towards uh, a larger scale uh, implementation and testing in a more formal way. So going from sort of a survey phase to an implementation and feedback phase, and then moving uh, towards a refinement uh, in the year three, recognizing that that process doesn't ever stop, but it takes learning, it takes a process for us to learn how to do that well together. And giving us three years to build a community uh, that is ready to move uh, and expand from that, uh, from those uh, those core hubs into our own networks, um, and uh, ready for the the network effect, both socially but also technologically. So that's that's the very quick overview of uh, where we are with the o Open Team uh, initiative, uh, and some of the partners. I I'm mentioning primarily the technical partners. Um, but it's a it's a larger uh, consortium of uh, of government and foundation uh, and um, uh, and corporate entities that are uh, interested not just in the problem statement uh, around nutrient density, but that is really important. I think that's incredibly appealing. But also some of these other environmental services. So as you can see, this process that. BFA is unlocking has a huge potential consequence uh, in a different way of doing science and in showing a way that this that there is a better way to do this that's lower cost, more participatory, and uh, will uh, sets the stage for a much wider scale participation uh, in the development of our of the next stage of science and how we understand. Uh, agriculture and the environment and how we affect it. Do we have enough? I want to make sure we have enough time for questions and also for Lisa. Yes? So have you selected all of your hub farms? I'm assuming you're wanting them to be relatively distributed. Are the farms invited to be sort of uh, center points to their region so that they can help bring the larger community Precisely. So what we have now, we have not finalized uh, this, and this will be launched, I should have mentioned the timeline. The plan is to launch in 2019, and uh, we certainly have uh, a subset of those home farms fairly asserted, but we're trying, we, uh, we have not selected all of them at this point. Um, so uh, especially as we're bringing in new partners, that's one of the key things that if uh, a, a, a partner with a particular interest in a production system. They, we will want to have one of their own farms as part of it. But the idea is that the home farms are both uh, a, a farm that uh, is recognized in the region, has the capacity to gather people, has the technical support capacity. We'll be providing additional support to those home farms as well, but uh, that they have, they're part of a larger network, uh, and that as they get into year, uh, in the later years, they'll be able to be an influential influential in the region. And it doesn't, as you all know, agriculture is intensely local. Uh, and so it doesn't matter if it works on the other side of the state, even in many cases, it has to be demonstrated 
uh, in that local culture, even if the underlying, you know, even if the science is the same, if the, soci the sociology is not. Yes? So the tell them. We have two questions right there. Um, yes, we'll go with you first. Uh, this all sounds like a great improvement from the productive uh, end of things. You know, getting these organizations together to integrate more and interact much more. The thing that I wonder about is the general public. We are not people who are interested in this. These are very people who have been eating food that has inhibited their mental capacities. <laughs> How are you going to bring that side of this thing forward so that it begins to meet? So Lisa's going to jump on it. So what we're providing is essentially the platform to provide high quality information that can then create data driven stories. So, uh, so not, and I say story not in that we're making it up, but in being able to create a narrative that's fact based. Uh, around these, it's uh, and some of that is is making it relevant to the to uh, your own backyard and making the, what was invisible visible and putting these hands. Uh, it, 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 often the complexity of this is too much for individuals to interpret. So it's providing essentially a, a community to help interpret and engage in the complexity that's are, are you know even in our in our backyards and happening in our complex models. You have to ignite something in people, though. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And I think that's, but that's, that's where I, I, I tried to touch on it in that part of this is redefining who's engaged in agriculture. And it's not just farmer agriculture. In this case, becomes a shared human endeavor. And we see this process of feedback uh, as, uh, um, as, uh, you know, as essentially part of our our our, our, our civic uh, our civic engagement uh, in in uh, uh, in engaging in observation and contribution and conversation. Yes. So I don't know if this may add some sort of statement to this or not, but with epigenetics of the study of uh, of, of pollens. The uh, structural analysis, the quantity and quality of those columns, and the different variabilities on those farms and areas that affect the column, which is you know, carries that information to its offspring. Right? Is that the subset of the study yet? So I, I think the way I would answer that is that I, I that those kinds of questions feed into this larger systems framework. So to the extent that you can feed in information at the observational level, at the ground level, and then aggregate that with the rest of the context, it becomes more, more possible to ask more questions and more people to ask those questions. So, uh, uh, so that's where I, 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 rather than address it in general, I would say that we have more techniques for observing in more detail than we have in the past. And the limitation has been to be putting those in context to make them make them useful. So I, I so it's that, that first stage and that context is really important. And then also in that context meaning uh, also including people and in the way in which we're interacting uh, with 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 that system. Other question. I guess that, to me it seems like adoption is going to be, I mean, there's, it's wonderful to make the data more accessible, but I guess my question is are you going to rely mostly on the sort of organic adaptive management of farmers, or is there going to be some kind of direct? Oh, so that's what this, this is about. So, so the decision tools are meant to provide the agronomic reasons why an individual farmer might adapt to practices. And at the base, they have to work at that level also. So that's the first of the forms, and that's what's going to drive initial adoption. Uh, the rest of these are also values that everybody else in the system cares about. So we collectively, this as a public research project, as a public science, we want better agriculture. So research has a value, and we can provide additional incentives and pay for that 
in addition, and, 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 and then if you go to the next level, what we're talking about is adding in incentives for practices that will be that will reduce the, that are that they aren't inherently being priced into the market in the price of foods. Uh, and uh, that's and then the final that that top is really different rather than a payment directly to the farmer. It's actually a collective valuation of the improved asset value that the land is improved. The total function of that land has actually changed due to management, either up or down, but that we can quantify that and measure it and provide incentives. And that goes with the land. It doesn't go with the farmer. So those are all play into what drives adoption and change into those practices. And they're related and they're, and they're uh, dependent on change in the farm level. So that's sort of the importance of starting with that farm level decision support and making it work today or in six months or a year uh, in terms of changing water. You know, you may be moving towards wanting to get a better price for improved nutrient density, but the market's not there for it yet. So in the meantime, you can improve soil health that's going to improve water capacity and drought resist resistance or improve infiltration and reduce inputs in the shorter run by using cover crops and reducing tillage or whatever those practices that are specific to you. Uh, crop. But I think it's that creating that chain of value that's important for implementation and creating the social, this social, this feedback and community around seeing that it works uh, uh, and, 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 and then being able to share that to create the network effect of that. Because it's great if we have like one really terrific farmer, you know, in, in Brazil or something. It doesn't do, if, if we're really trying to change the whole system, we need to know what aspects of that are universally applicable and what are safe to say. Yes? So it sounds as if a lot of this is from, from bottom up and it starts with farm and farmer. Yes. So how are you doing the outreach and training and management on that level to make sure that everything... So the approach here is to create the tools to allow exchange across production systems and, and, uh, and across languages and geographies. So that, and rely on existing networks to connect with one another. So right now we have lots of uh, good networks that we have communication tools in terms of email and forums and so forth. But as far as communicating, the actual, you know, it's like taking a digital, the digital picture is really powerful as far as explaining what goes on. This is taking that digital picture and adding analytic layers so that you can actually have that peer-to-peer -peer conversation and exchange that uh, and find what's common and what's different in your location. So it's creating a system for global knowledge exchange, but that can be then brought down to the site-specific level. Um, and so that's this combination of you know looking at uh, your soil microbiology and looking at the landscape through remote sensing, but making that accessible. So when you have a conversation at the coffee shop with your peers, you have context. You have the same tools that. Uh, that uh, were previously reserved for you know, large governments and, uh, and uh, corporations. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's essentially creating that, that open digital ecosystem of tools to allow for better conversations. Yes? So you said that you didn't see the value attributed back to the technology that the farmer would use. Providing, why are you saying that? I'm, sure. oh, I, I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, you, you're saying that it's attributed to the land. Oh, so yeah.
So yeah. markets need numbers. You can't. You, you need quantification in order to uh, to be able to you know to recognize that we can do it sort of abstractly uh, as we value sort of intangibles, things like art. But or you can value it as you value it. it was, it, that intelligence and the land generated a cash flow stream. You capitalize the value of that cash flow stream. That shows there's real economic resource there. Yeah. So that that's an output that, that we will get. That's part of that right now is is, is that that those values represent uh, streams that will that in a regenerative system they will continue. Uh, as long as the management continues. So, um, I think I'm out of time. One more question. Okay. Are you good? Okay. One more question. Yes. So back to the thing about the problem. There's 25,000 year studies that show climatic and human impacts on the output of the quality of the pollen and the quantity. Or deforestation is taking the loss of ecosystem variabilities come into play. Demonstrate 25,000 year period of discussion over 10,000 years of agriculture. It's, so you know, the, the, the ability of, of farmers and, and societies to break down the of regenerative resource. Restoration agriculture is doing is not understated without a doubt. So, just to, just to close on that, I think this, the, the, what this technical ecosystem will allow us to do is take historical data and put it in context where it's possible and then add to it these uh, new, uh, new ways of measuring uh, and use that to inform future decision making and make it actionable. And so put it in, into the context of an individual farm operation because that's where we actually need the transformation. But we need to take that kind of information and make it ex accessible and relevant. Okay, so I've got to give it up to the loops of it here. But happiness to us. Um, so how many people are just kind of feeling excited about what we're doing? Yeah, awesome. Oh, I love hearing that. That's so great. Thank you. Um, how many people know exactly where they can plug in with this? Okay. How many people would like to plug in and help and be a part of this? Wonderful. Oh, fun. <laughs> so what do I do? What have I done in my past? Um, I do advocacy work. Um, I come from the state of Iowa. I started at a really basic level, you know, the community level, you know, having 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 dinners for people, and um, I really got. I'm glad that I started at that level because um, I had some of those close personal interactions, just like this gentleman was referring to. And and then we went to um, the national level, and my organization that I was a co-founder of is Food Democracy Now. Has anybody heard of Food Democracy Now? Okay, great, thanks. Um, so we started out from, from Iowa. I did um, a lot of policy work, or actually policy on regulations, um, as it relates to um, getting people, as it relates to um, agriculture, obviously, but getting people to correlate with our policies, with what we actually see on our plates, right, on the table, and then also how that translates to um, our society, and also our, our just our very own human body. So we did a lot of that work. So were you for uh, GMOs or educating people about what it does? I was a part of educating people um, like what some of the, the challenges were and some of the harms of genetically engineered crops, socially, um, economically, um, to our health, to, to farmers, to the land, to the water, um, and also educating them on the pesticide system, pesticide treadmill that it put us on. Um, so and so ran, that's. So they ran you out of uh, Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a really good question. I was a little bit incognito there as far as all that work. I really was. Um, yeah, I was a strange place in that way. You know, where you have to still be in a community, right? Yeah, my um, Santo has you on a, uh, a target, the circle and the measure basically. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, that's maybe not so far from the truth. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> It's okay. So that's a really good segue to where I want to go with that. So I was engaged a lot in like, here's the problem, people. Here's the problem, okay? And we, I felt like after probably 2012, we did this, we were an integral part of doing the ballot initiative in California to label genetically engineered foods. So have you been a part of all, all of any of that in your states or federally or whatever advocating for that? Okay. So I was really in the trenches on that. And that was like, that was the problem, right? And so after 2012, what I said to my partner at that time is I said, you know what, I feel like we just pushed this really huge boulder up a hill. And now it's like rolling down. And it's really great. If now people are coming and saying, okay, this is, this is obviously a problem, and this is affecting my health, and this is affecting my child's health, they think. What do I do? Right? What do I do? And we, in the meantime, have all kind of been in the space of like, okay, yeah, what are the solutions, right? And so my new organization is, um, is Next7, and it's about thinking about the next seven generations, right? And what are the next seven generations? And it's an Iroquois great law piece that in every deliberation, we must consider the impact upon the next seven generations. Just imagine and think for just a moment, if in everything that we did, right? All the roads we built, all the buildings we built, our policies, right? What we bought, what we sold, what we threw away. And we were thinking about what the impact was in the next seven generations. How much would that just, right, just that moment change our society? Just that thought, right? That intention. And so I thought, that's, that's a really good north for me, right? It has been for a long time. I'm also going to read you something really quick. I, I was going to float this up a little bit, so I'm going to read it. This is one of my very favorite quotes. I'm sure all of you have heard it, but this is what informs. I think this work that we're here to do right now. And it's one of my favorite quotes from Bucky Fuller. And it says, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the old one obsolete. Right? And so I was engaged in fighting the old. And I'm, and, and I'm really proud of that work. I'm proud of all the people that I worked with. And I, I'm still really grateful for the work that we're, they're doing. But I'm going to show you, this is something that um, Dan and I sit around and we talk about quite a bit, actually. And when, when the number of days was really coalesced in my mind, it was really one of those eureka moments. And I'm going to, sh I'm going to share it with you here. And so this is what, this is what Dan and I have called the virtuous circle. Okay. And so all of us are very keenly aware, I know, of all of the problems right now. We can't, we, we really, we can't get away from it, right? I'm sure a lot of you saw, the, or many of you probably saw the climate report that came out on Black Friday, right? It was not, not very encouraging. Very, very sobering. And so what are we talking about here today? We're talking about, we're talking about food and agriculture, essentially. And we're talking about nutrition. The goal of the BFA is to increase nutrition, right, in food. Increase nutrient density in food. Right? I think, okay. That's, that, obviously, that sounds like a really good thing to do. What do we get? What do we get when we do that? And I want you to all, like, engage, too. Because I would, I would love that Dan and I could even add to this list. That would be great. I know there's probably a lot of side effects of this, right? So I think, okay. So we're going to increase, you know, nutrient, nutrition, density, in food. When we do that, what, do, what, what results from that? When we're increasing nutrient density in food, you think, okay, obviously, what? Reduced malnutrition. Yeah. Hunger. Yeah. So we've got health, <clears throat> and the, down, the uh, negative side of that, of course, is degenerative diseases. Anyone think we're in an epidemic of degenerative diseases right now? Okay. So, as you, I'm not going to go into a lot of this because this is why you're all here, right? You're not going to hear about all of these brilliant people who are working on this this, this weekend, right? So, um, Robert, I thought Robert was in here, this Robert. <laughs> um, Robert is going to talk more about how to correlate, right? Our, our, how we can correlate our deficiency in certain minerals to diseases, right? So, if we stop thinking about them, we'll just add this quick, as diseases and thinking of them as symptoms of deficiencies. Right? Then we step out of the pharmaceutical model. 
and we start treating those symptoms that our bodies are having, right? That they just, they're just, they're asking for healing. Our bodies really work actually very, very well, right? When we have pain that's saying, okay, pay attention to this. When we have inflammation that's our body trying to protect us. Those aren't really the problems. There's a, there's a root problem to that, and a lot of it can be solved with nutrition. So health, right? Degenerative diseases. Um, what else? How about um, how about the effect on farms and farmers? What's the positive effect there? Right? Can we help farms and farmers have more positive economic viability? Right? What would you do if you knew that there was a farm that was in or near you, maybe even not so near you, you might even try to get it, you knew that that was some of the most nutrient-dense food that you could get your hands on, that it could help you raise your children in a way that can give them a really solid foundation for life, or help to heal you of some of those symptoms. What would you do to get that food? Would there be a price on it? Would you say, no, that's too expensive? I'm not gonna buy that? Probably not. Be like, I want that, right? This is what we can do, we can create this everywhere we need to create this everywhere this is this is really our right to have this this is what was given to us when we came here we've just we've just gotten away from it that's all right we can do this and this is one of the ways to do it what about um what about our future right i mentioned our children i have four my oldest is 27 and he ate organic from the time he was a baby at that time i had to drive three hours one way to get it in Iowa City. I did it, because I knew just what I said. I was committed to that. I made a lifestyle out of it. I knew that it would be worth it for me to do that. And so, what if people didn't have to make those choices? I mean, I was, you know, totally not typical for most people to do that, right? Um, but I'm so glad that I did. My youngest is 17, and they're all healthy, right? They don't have any, don't have any anything. They don't have any diseases or issues, they don't get sick, they have amazing immune systems, they're smart, they're wonderful people in the world, right? A lot of it, what is it? It's, it's nutrition. It's about keeping chemicals away from them, and it's just basically about like, letting humans flourish as humans, right? And we can do that with deep nutrition. Um, what else? Go ahead. Hydrology. I'm sorry? Hydrology. Hydrology? Is that what you said? Solution. You're a scientist, right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear this. Tell me. That's one we don't have on our list. That's great. If you have more carbon in the soil, you're storing more water in the soil. Nice. Yeah. This it goes into the Mississippi River, it goes down to the ocean, it creates gigantic dead zones which kill the fishing communities, yeah. which it has. If you have better hydrology in the soil, you're actually cooling the climate because the agriculture inspiration of plants is what cools the atmosphere. And so if you have the winter time, you have less soil cover on the soil, the soil is not absorbing the water, not creating photosynthesis, not cooling the atmosphere, it's losing carbon, it's polluting the water, polluting the soil, polluting the air, polluting us. Yeah. So the, there's a organization called Rain for Climate. There's another organization called Soil for Climate. Yeah. There's another organization right. called Biodiversity for Climate. Yeah. So the emphasis in the climate change movement is ridiculously excessively concentrated on the source of the carbon mm -hmm. instead of the sink of the carbon. Right. So, and it's cheaper if we mm -hmm. absorb the everything that's coming at us from the sun, the water, the nutrients, through the hydrological cycle, and it's one of the cheapest ways of reversing climate change impacts. Beautiful. Thank you. Yes. Climate. We have climate. Let's put that there. Walter Gannon talks a lot about that, too, in a very beautiful way. Thank you. So, yes, climate. This is, I saw, um, after I read the, uh, the, the climate report the other day, I read stories about the climate report, I read the big report. But um, I saw, I'm gonna float this idea by you, but I saw, I read an article um, where they think it might be a really good idea instead to dim the sun. Anyone think that's a good idea? <laughs> <laughs> it's for real, for real, it was in CNN. It's like, oh, okay, that is about the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Nutrition. 
That's what chemtrails were. Right? That's what it, it was, was, it was chemtrails. They were basically talking about chemtrails in a very veiled way. I don't remember what the words they were using. And I told Dan, Dan's like, no, that's chemtrails. <laughs> um, what about our soil? Is anyone concerned about our loss of topsoil? Yes. Yeah, right? Deep nutrition. Soil, we can heal our soil. Let's try, go ahead. The fabric of community, and just real briefly, when I bring that yeah. up, and people have ever heard of the uh, Peter Crocker, One Man, One Cow, One Planet. It's a story yeah. of like biodynamic farming and how, yeah. how that transformed India back transform India back into a sustainable society given off some industrial agriculture. Yes, creating the community and industrial agriculture, all of the inputs come from the external sources and all of the value is extracted and leaves the community other places. So absolutely it's super critical. Yes. Thank you. I, I talk about that a lot in my advocacy work is how having these local farmers, right, that are doing regenerative organic agriculture are at the heart of thriving communities. In Iowa, I saw that very, very clearly, what industrial agriculture did to communities. Um, now we see here, so we covered I mean, water pollution, water quality, right, we covered that. How about, how about our animals? Is anyone, is anyone concerned about our animals, right? Yeah. What if, our, what if our animals were eating nutrient-dense food? Not only our pets, but also our, our food animals, right? Wouldn't that be better for all of us, right? There would be less stress. I, I personally feel that feeding animals feed that's genetically engineered and that's glyphosate pesticides is a form of, of animal abuse, right? Because it upsets them just like it upsets us, right? This is one that Dan and I also love to talk about. What about... And this gentleman over here touched on consciousness. I was going to bring that one up, actually. Yeah, bring it up. <laughs> our relationship with nature uh, is, is on the horizon changing with this development. Yeah. Uh, because health, because we're promoting health, um, I, think, I think that has going to have a profound effect on the way that we relate to nature. Because actually, to look after nature, and make nature healthy is going to make us healthy. Mm -hmm. So it's about entering back into symbiotic relationship again with nature. Yes. It's a relationship between seven. Mm -hmm. um, so consciousness is wrapped up in, in, in that. In that Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And well, and this is gentleman pointed out that I mean, and I and this is probably not very politically correct to say, but when my kids say, "Oh, can you believe that that, that they did that? They're not really thinking very well." Or, that was a stupid move that they made, and you know, turning in front of me, I said, oh honey, I said, it's okay. I said, they probably eat GMOs. <laughs> you know, but really, when we have a poor diet, right? I mean, we all know, just even after we've eaten, like, if we all eat really well here, right? And we eat one meal or get something, and we maybe go to somebody's house, we don't want to be rude, and we eat some food that's not, you know, organic or, you know, whatever, we can feel it. We can feel it almost right away, right? So there's a lot of people out there that this is the only access to food that they really have, right? So I think I just how you feel neurological. It's so much, right? And that's what we're like I said, I'm not gonna go into so much all of that because we're here to learn all of that this weekend. There's so many amazing speakers. But this is this is the virtuous circle, right? And there's so many more things we can all continue to add to this. But what one thing I really wanted to leave you with is where did you where do you, where do you fit into all of this? What is really important to you, right? Maybe you are someone who's like, I really just, I'm really, really passionate about nutrition, which is awesome, right? But maybe you're someone who says, I'm really passionate about children and our future. Or maybe you're someone who's really passionate about, you know, worrying about climate change, thinking about climate change, right? Climate instability. Where do you fit into all of this, right? And where are the people that you know where do they fit into this? This is this is where we make the change. Dan wanted me to give a talk <laughs> on how to build a movement, right? <laughs> and I said, well, sweet, I don't think I can do that in 15 minutes, <laughs> you know? But um, this is the heart of it right here, right? It's all about what we each deeply care about. And this, I think, I think this can get us here. 
I think if we can all engage in this, right? We create a plan so big. We create a plan so big that if everybody, or almost everybody, participates in it, we can pull it off, right? We want a plan that big. And we can do that. We need every single one of you here. Every person has a part here. Even if you're not a scientist, if you're not a farmer, if you're not a grower, you're here and you have a lot of influence, right? In your communities, in your families, just by whatever it is that you hold and carry with you, right? How you touch people. So, I think I'm out of time. Please, can I just add one more? It's just evolution. That's, oh. that's my, my point. So, ah, um, evolution is yes. um, quite exciting. Yeah. I think we're looking yeah. at stuff as a human race. Yeah. And um, this offers us the opportunity to be connected with nature and, um, and, and come to higher consciousness, maybe. Yes. And I think that's exciting in the future. Yeah. Um, I think we've got great potential, possibilities that could be realized. Absolutely. Yeah, you got it. It's not just humanity, it's evolution of life. Yeah. All of that. I think we're the ones that need to evolve more of them, to be honest with you. <laughs> but yeah. All right. One more question. Okay, go ahead. I uh, just wanted to add in the gross domestic product in healthcare, as well as the expense and impact on a global level. Uh, if, you, if you look at the expense for nutrition, farming, agricultural, not only from a human perspective, but also going back to an animal perspective, you know, vet bills, that comes out of nutrition as well. You know, a lot of these have uh, cyclic impacts on multiple subcategories of the GDP. So when you start thinking about healthcare over the last 50 years, going from 5 to 20% just for human healthcare. Yeah. That's a massive change. It's not just what we eat, it's what our neighbors eating is costing us because of their health care also. So it isn't just for our own personal, it, it's, it's yes. for our community. You know, one of the things I see a lot of, uh, some of the take homes I'm getting from the presentation so far are from a micro perspective of one farm next to another farm or one person next to another person. But if we change the relativity of that perspective and we zoom out to more of a macro perspective, you'll notice large farms impact large farms, states impact states, nations impact nations. 100%. Thank you for that. Go ahead. Just to add on to that, I mean, also we have to remember that in large parts of the world, grains of stunting and undernutrition that comes directly from lack of micronutrients in the mm -hmm. diet mm -hmm. affect entire generations. And they work in epigenetic ways. They sort of predispose you to obesity. And I think it's... Okay, we have degenerative diseases, but we live in a very, very affluent society. And in the rest of the world, there are nations with 60% safe deficiency. Mm -hmm. So yes. I think to think on a, on a bigger level, even about the health impacts of poor nutrition and Yes, thank you. And you have a talk coming up. We're going to talk about all this, right? This weekend? I don't, I, I oh, you don't? Oh, 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 maybe you should. Yeah. <laughs> 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 All right. Dan, do you have anything to say? Uh, lunch is served. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs>